and will be provided in future budgets that council may approve. I move the uh, consent agenda, uh, A through H, or A motion by Mr. Steiger, supported by Mr. Frazier, to approve items A through H in the consent agreement. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Aye. Aye. Motion is carried. Next, we have public hearings. Um, we post only Sorry, I'm attorney, 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 attorney. Um, we postpone these. Do we start with this? Are we picking up in the middle of this one? Is with respect to public hearing A, that that public hearing had been opened but never closed. So we would continue with that public hearing. Uh, with respect to public hearing B, that had never been opened. Never been opened. All right. So we would be in the middle of the public hearing. Right. Right. The public hearing right. for A. GP 1232 Special Needs Request of Parish. I'm not sure how to pronounce this. So could I? Cadilla Pharmacy on behalf of the only Dr. Kamal Gupta. The Canada Pharmacy and Subscription Center will locate in or near medical offices in the OS Office Service Zoning District. Is the petitioner here? Could I make an opening statement? Of course. I want to reintroduce this item for the people who weren't here last time. Please do. <coughs> wanted to make a brief statement with regard to the public hearing notices. As a result of issues brought up at the City Council meeting held on January 23rd, 2012 regarding the validity of public hearing notices, we offer the following comments. With regard to legal notice requirements, the Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, PA 110 of 2006 as amended, requires the following four items of each notice. One, describe the nature of the request, to indicate the property that is the subject of the request. C, state when and where the request will be considered. D, indicate when and where written comments will be received concerning the request. After review of both the Planning Commission and City Council public notices, each of the four requirements were satisfied. In the future, we will work with the City Clerk's Office to clean up and standardize the introductory language. Second issue is regards to the notice of publication. Michigan Zoning Enabling Act, PA 110 of 2006, as amended, states that the local unit of government shall publish notice of the hearing in a newspaper of general circulation in the local unit of government not less than 15 days before the date of the public hearing. Section 5.221 of the Special Use Procedure of the Zoning Ordinance, which was last amended on February 27, 1989, currently has the antiquated notice requirements of not less than five days, no more than 15 days prior to the public hearing. These special use procedure notice requirements changed in 2006 when PA 110 was amended. All four of the council public hearing notices from the January 23rd meeting complied with both the city and state requirements. The planning and legal departments will draft an amendment to the zoning ordinance for your consideration to update this section of the ordinance. And we are currently in the process at the planning commission level we have scheduled a public hearing to review this um, section of the ordinance and make recommendations back to the council in March. So there was, uh, this issue was discussed at your committee of the whole meeting, but uh, because of the viewing audience, I felt like that I wanted to read that into the record. Thank you, Mr. President. Now I'd like to open up um, <coughs> the first public hearing or re re reacquaint not, everybody. Not right, reacquaint everybody with GP 1232. Again, a special use request of the Villa Pharmacy on behalf of the owner, Dr. Karma Gupta, Gupta, to permit a pharmacy and prescription center when located in or near medical offices, medical clinics, hospitals, convalescent or nursing homes, or similar facilities in the OS, Office Service Zoning District. This request is made to facilitate the operation of a 1,283 gross square foot pharmacy within the existing medical office building located at 23832 Southfield Road. I have a brief video presentation and then um, ask the applicant to, to uh, introduce themselves prior to taking further public comment. Thank you. 
with a special use request to deal with pharmacy on behalf of the owner, Dr. Kamal Gupta, to permit a pharmacy and prescription center use within an existing medical office building in the OS Office Service Zoning District. The property is located on the southeast corner of Southfield Road in Mount Vernon at 23832 Southfield Road in Section 25 of the city. The subject property, as well as the properties to the west across Southfield Road, to the east and to the south are zoned OS Office Service. The properties to the north across Mount Vernon are zoned OS Office Service and ERO Education Research Office. With regard to the existing land uses, the subject property is developed with an existing medical office building. The property to the north across Mount Vernon is developed with a love and care animal hospital and a parking lot for the Century Office Plaza. The property to the west across Southfield Road is developed with the Pollock Academic Center. The property to the south is developed with the International Gospel Deliverance Church. The property to the east is developed with a driveway to the church and single family residential uses farther east fronting Mount Vernon. The site contains 1.87 acres of land. There is 200 feet of frontage on Southfield Road and a depth of 260 feet. The special use request is to permit a pharmacy and prescription center within an existing medical office building in the OS Office Service Zoning District. The proposed site plan indicates the establishment of a 1,283 gross square foot pharmacy within the existing medical office building at 23832 Southfield Road. The parking required for the development is 30 spaces with 48 provided on site. The square footage of landscaping provided exceeds the requirements of the zoning ordinance. The elevations are to remain the same. Issues considered by the planning department during the review of the special use were the special use general standards and conditions of the OS Office Service Zoning District. The proposal is in accordance with the Southfield Comprehensive Master Plan noting local mixed use for the parcel and the petitioner is to implement the recommendations made by the Southfield Police Department's Crime Prevention Bureau regarding site security. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Dr. Kamal Gupta. Um, I'm the owner of uh, uh, the property that I just mentioned. Uh, the pharmacy inside the building uh, will be primarily used by the existing urgent care that's already in the, entry, in the front part of the, the building. Uh, this uh, will be a great asset to the people who actually visit the pharmacy. They will not have uh, the medical office because they will not have to go and look for pharmacy elsewhere. And uh, there are other uh, home cares and other facilities around this area that will also be using this uh, pharmacy. And um, it's well constructed. I don't see any reason why we cannot have a pharmacy in this area. I think it's, it's well done. We are willing to comply with uh, any request that the planning commission has. And, and uh, uh, I'm hoping that it will be soon approved to have this uh, facility. As I introduced myself in the last meeting, uh, I'll be the pharmacist over there in the pharmacy and we'll be running our pharmacy from 9 to 6 as I mentioned Monday to Friday and Saturday 9 to 2. Um, if any other questions? I don't think so. The cupboard room is still open. So at this time I'm going to ask any other questions to address the questions please come forward. And sir, uh, give your name and address for the record, and you have five minutes from the time that you begin speaking. Madam President, my name is Gerard Mullen. Since 1968, I've lived at 1788 Louise Street, 165 feet south of the petitioner's site. The only reason I'm standing here tonight, folks, is because the city failed to take care of business on the three issues I raised three weeks ago. Therefore, I wish to reinstate my original three legal challenges on January 23rd, 2012, plus I wish to add two more legal challenges 
for grand total of five legal challenges. Since I'm time limited, I will expand only on legal challenge number one. As you folks may recall, legal challenge number one was due to the failure of counsel to publish a proper legal notice regarding this petition, that is, to cite the correct article and section within this notice. Sad to say, even after three weeks, this is still the case. Consequently, counsel is not empowered tonight to act on this petition. Now I'd like to address the city attorney's legal opinion given January 30th, 2012, on this issue. Folks, do not be distracted by the city attorney's red herring that this notice is proper because it meets minimum state requirements. That assertion is totally irrelevant to this issue. This notice is improper because it violates South Bend City law, nothing to do with Lansing. Folks, I'm here tonight to set the record straight right now. You might ask, how does this notice violate city law? The city committed a compound double legal error regarding this notice. Let me explain. Legal error number one was due to the foolish and unnecessary reference to article and section within this notice. This is a practice the city has been engaged in for some period of time. Consequently, the city has established a pattern of past practice. Thus, the city created new law, the law of past practice. Once you make new law, you must obey the law that you created. Sad to say, the city didn't. And that was the city's second legal error. The city failed to obey its own law by not citing the correct article and section. The city made a legal error regarding this legal notice. Let me repeat that, folks. The city made a legal error regarding this legal notice. That is why this legal notice is improper. Nothing to do with the state of Michigan. That was the city attorney's red herring. In short, the city fell on its own sword. The sword was made in Southfield, not in Lansing. In a word, the city committed legal suicide. Legal suicide. The city violated city law. Nothing to do with the state of Michigan. Folks, again, do not be fooled by the city attorney's assertion that that is, that this notice is proper because it meets minimum state requirements. Again, that's totally irrelevant to this issue. The state does have an interest in this notice since it mandated this notice. The state's interest is to make sure that this notice is proper. And that is my interest. And it should be the interest of the city of Southfield. Sad to say, it isn't. At this time, I'd like to lodge a legal challenge within legal challenge number one. That is, legal challenge number 1A. Let me explain. The city attorney is the legal controlling authority for this legal notice. Consequently, he can't render a legal opinion on his own conduct. It would be like a high school student creating his own paper. In this case, the city attorney gave himself an A. That was no surprise. It is clear the city attorney has a conflict of interest and should recuse himself on this issue. And finally, regarding both notices, challenge one and challenge two, the city attorney cannot be allowed to create his own papers. It's cheating. It's cheating. The city council must seek outside legal counsel to resolve these legal issues. It's a clear Hobson's choice. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Pamela Jarrell, P.O. Box 155, Southfield, Michigan, 4807-0155. My telephone number is 248-3529188. You know, I'm really surprised with the way we tout that we have a standard. And make no mistake about it, I'm not saying that we don't have a standard at all with anything that we do. We do have some standards, but how can the city and the legal department and the clerk's office not be in sync with notices that are put out? And I know what Mr. Mullen is saying is true because I have often talked to the city attorney and also our main city clerk in reference to not knowing when a hearing should be posted on the board, also not knowing when a FOIA should be done. The city clerk, the main city clerk, will say that a FOIA is required, that you have to go through legal, 
and the city attorney and I have had this conversation numerous occasions. Then you go to the legal department, the legal department will say, that's not a FOIA issue. And the resident is often put in the center of two authorities that we respect, but we don't know who to believe. So I think with what Mr. Mullen is saying in reference to the manner in which we do business, we really need to establish a standard. We really need to come up with when a FOIA is necessary, when it's not necessary, do a better job citing the proper things, and make sure we get the notices out, not just in one paper. Every resident gets the Southfield Sun. All of these notices should be in the Southfield Sun and every other paper that's in the surrounding community. And I just want to ask specifically in reference to the pharmacy, have they already been dispensing medication at this location? And also, will they plan on dispensing this medical marijuana that doctors are able to do now? Thank you. Do you want to answer that? You don't have to. I don't have to answer it, but no, nothing has been dispensed from that pharmacy at the moment, and we're not planning to dispense any medical marijuana from that area, but the drugs that are prescribed by the physician will have to be dispensed from that facility. The only other thing that I'd like to say is that on behalf of the pharmacy, and as a taxpayer of Southfield myself, is that this is a personal vendetta that some people have against the planning commission. That has nothing to do with individuals who are planning to open up a facility there, and I think that we should reach some kind of a conclusion with this. The pharmacy is going to be employing people who actually live in the Southfield area, who have forward employees there. It's just hard to have a pharmacy that's just for the last three months in limbo. We can't reach some kind of a conclusion as to whether we can open it or not. This is very difficult to manage. I'm surprised how the country is actually functioning. Thank you. Hi, I'm Stephanie English, 28735 San Carlos, Southfield, 48076. I just had an interest in this particular issue. Mr. Crowe was going over it, and there was a lot of, like you said, inconvenience for the business owner. But my concern is just for the citizen is to ensure that there's oversight with this type of business. I'm pretty sure that it's reputable, but I know that I've read over a period of time of smaller pharmacies sometimes getting entrenched in this building to the government, dispensing sometimes illegal drugs. The smaller pharmacies sometimes become a spot to dispense that. I'm not casting any aspersions to the business owner. I just have a concern as a citizen to ensure that, in addition to police safety in terms of property protection, that that be a part of the oversight, similar to what we would have if we allowed or gave out liquor licenses. I don't know if the city has oversight for pharmacies, but I think that if any drugs are dispensed, and especially on the smaller businesses, that we ensure that it's proper and that there's never any illicit or illegal activity. And again, with respect, I do not cast that on this business owner, but that's my concern that there really be good oversight since it is going to be a smaller pharmacy. And do you know if the department has that type of, or the police department has that type of oversight at all? Is that all? I mean, can he answer the question? You're asking the petitioner? No. Or anyone? No. Or through the chair, I guess through you. Can you help me with that? Or is that a question that's feasibly answered? Does the police department also ensure that the integrity of the business is ensured since you're talking about drug dispensement? Madam City Attorney, do we, does our police department have oversight over pharmacies? There would be regulations from the federal government and they could involve our police department. But not on a routine basis. Unless there was some evidence or some basis for thinking that something was occurring there that was outside of actually prescribed medicines, I would say no, it wouldn't be. On a case-by-case basis, but not on a regular routine basis. Is 
that answer your question? Yes. All right, thank you. Anyone else? Seeing none, I declare this public hearing closed. Council? Madam Chair. Uh, I'll just make one comment that I do really respect our, our planning department, our planning director, and our legal staff. And in the past saying that, I approve GP1232 special use request that is before us this evening. Motion by Mr. Percassi, do I have support? Support. Support by Mr. Seiber. Any discussion, Council? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? The motion has carried. You uh, have been approved. The next item, uh, GP 1233, Mr. Sosa, do you wish Thank to? You. Thank you. I'd like to bring, make a brief statement that we have a video and then um, we are going to ask the applicant to address the council. GP 1233 is a special use request of Emmanuel Stewart on behalf of the owner TEG Associates LLC to permit a non-industrial use for use not specifically related to manufacturing in the I-1 industrial zoning district. This request is made to facilitate the establishment of a 7,956 gross square foot prompt gym in the existing building located at 23080 Telegraph Road and have a brief uh, video presentation.
155 South Bill, Michigan, 48037-0155. My telephone number is 248-352-9188. I and my family have known Emmanuel Stewart for over 25 years. As these two gentlemen alluded to, he's put his footprint in uh, the city of Detroit having a crunk gym and to be a Southfield resident and now wanting to bring such a facility to Southfield, I think is something that we should be proud of. Um, in case you don't remember, Crump did the event, Crump versus Mexico, that was held here at the Southfield Pavilion. It was a well-attended event. At that event, they had uh, little boxers from the age of five or six all the way up to, I think it was like 19 or 20. Um, the residents were proud. I saw a lot of the city officials there. I was there, and it was a great event. Um, if you don't really know a lot about Emmanuel Stewart, he's produced some really famous boxers. Uh, Thomas Hitman Hearns, um, Michael Moore, he's had a... Uh, He, he's produced maybe about five or six boxes. He's worked with uh, Lennox Lewis. And I mean, when you talk about boxing and you mention Emmanuel Stewart, Crump is just there. So I am definitely in support of this project. I think the young guys in the area, the teens, will be able to use such a facility, maybe get their frustration out on the bag, and also probably be discovered as a young talent. So I would like to see City Council, without hesitation, approve this project. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Good. 
look and make sure that we had uh, done the right things in uh, improving these uh, two uh, public hearings and uh, to our satisfaction, we felt that the legal advice and those of the director were uh, accurate and so therefore uh, that is why I did move on these both uh, public hearings. Mm -hmm. I would just like to say, I think that the um, reputation of the Congressman is well known and certainly well deserved. And I'm happy that you are a willing to list of members. It's not a drop in situation. Um, your, your reputation speaks for itself. I don't think you need anyone telling us. Uh, we all know. So we're happy to approve this. Um,
don't need an oversight from, um, from people in the audience. They can speak anytime they want, but don't make it sound like the oversight that you that you influenced us, that you're the oversight, and if we say yes, smile, wave your hand, and you say no, well, no. But of course you know where it's going to go because it benefits the city and everything else. I don't need remarks, oversight on any any decision that we have to make or I have to make. So I am going to answer the people who come up and say, hey, I like it, I like it. Okay, they like it. That's oversight. And I think that's interfering with the business of the city. Thank you. Yes, uh, I have a question for Mr. Zoyan. And maybe you said it, but I wasn't, I guess I didn't catch what you said it. Uh, the, uh, you're going to use NSP3 funds to work on homes that were bought with NSP one dollars. Correct. But they're only only the ones in the NSP three area. That is correct. Okay. In the, in the NSP one in the NSP three targeted neighborhood. You're correct. Yes. Just so that people don't no. feel that it, it's any place in the, in the community. Yes. Okay. Appendix seven in their attachment. Fred, I, I would just like to ask you, just to <coughs> read this uh, again and the comments that were made. Uh, my thought was, we really spend money on homes. How many homes are we talking about? 15? This this number of homes that we've uh, acquired, we have, on the we have 19 spec homes. Some are under contract to be sold. Um, I believe we have four under contract my thought was, <clears throat> you know, uh, there are a lot of individuals who are investing in homes. You see, the federal government is talking about, uh, <coughs> excuse me, buying the rent. And there's a lot of uh, individuals out there who have quite a bit of money that are speculating on, on these homes. And uh, rather than us putting money into the homes that that are on the market to need rehabbing so that they could be sold, advertised and sold and find buyers for it, that we sell those in blocks and offer them uh, some the investors offer them some kind of a of a uh, I guess a fee, give them a money so that they have an obligation to bring it up to code and put their money into the home and so that we could spread out the amount of money that we are getting from the federal government. In other words, I'm looking at a way in which we could take what we're getting and spread it out further and kind of get rid of some of this inventory that we have. I just looked at this, you know, this map that you have here and, and we're not gaining, as I said before in the meeting, we don't seem to be gaining on the amount of vacant homes. And, and I'm just looking at another way that we could sell blocks of them to investors so that they bring them up to, to standards to the, uh, you know, so that they become uh, occupied, meet all the standards and building codes, and they put their money into it, and whatever they do, that they bring them, they've got to register with the city anyway. And so we're getting rid of some homes that way without spending all the money that we're getting from the rehab. Does that make sense? It, it, it does make sense. It, it, the challenge we have, and I, I think that's a fantastic idea. The issue is you're using federal guidelines for a program which is a subset of community development. And the issue is you can't do anything for a spec for a speculative uh, for a speculative corporate entity or an individual to buy three or four homes and flip the homes. We've been approached by a number of people who want us to partner with them in flipping. The issue is NSP homes. The benefit has to go to one individual who is income eligible, uh, goes to a training program. There's a whole set of, of requirements within this program that all of our clients have to go through. Um, 
I, I agree that your concept would be a good way to leverage these funds to do something. The reality of the restrictions on the funds is the, ben the benefit is meant to go to an individual who is income eligible. That income eligibility goes up to 120% of the area medium income, who's gone through an eight-hour training program, uh, who can get a mortgage, who can come up with a minimum of 3.5% down payment. All of those requirements have to be met. I, I, I like the way you're thinking, and I think we need more programs like that to help invest and to bring the homes up to standard. I think the biggest challenge we have is so many of the homes have sat neglected um, by the banks and Fannie Mae and HUD, uh, the owners of these properties, that they're in dire need uh, of, of investment. Well, my big concern is that we have so many homes out there that now uh, we're getting homes, I know there's one in my neighborhood that, that they got into the garage and they took all the copper out of it. Now we have a home that is almost a shell, and that becomes a big dollar amount for somebody to go in and rehab it, get it back into a uh, point where it could be occupied. So I'm trying to figure out what happens to that house now. You know, does it do we finally get enough money to fix it up? And how much money is it going to take? And and the quicker we get rid of homes, the less attractive we are to those people who want to vandalize them. And, and I, I guess it came to my mind when I, when I heard the federal government talking about <coughs> uh, own to rent. Well, that's, that's really the program I'm really talking about. Are the federal dollars that are going to be expended for that purpose that will be going through the local units of government to then pick those individuals or groups or whatever it is after you review them and, and uh, check them all out, uh, that that they could fix up these homes and, and then rent them and maybe they could be tied to it that they have to own them over a period of time or the people they flip them to have to own them for a period of time or something like that you have, you, you don't have to flip, flip you know, on them, like some people do today. And I, I just you know, look at these marks all over this map here and I'm saying, man, that's a lot of houses. And, and there's some of how that we can moving along a little faster before the, the all deteriorate. The, the administration is tracking the latest, that, what you are referencing, the federal government, the president does have a proposal where um, there would be entities that could come in and buy homes and rent them out to we find qualified buyers. It's not been put into a formal program. Uh, we've seen a 10-page document where that's one of the concepts being discussed. Um, this evening we're looking at NSP3 funds and what those funds can be spent for within the parameters of that program. Well, I know you're doing a great job in, in getting this, I mean, it's a thankless job you have and I, and I respect all the work you and everyone else and staff is doing, but I just, uh, I guess I just get antsy about all the homes that, that you're not reaching. I, and we, we there's we no, nothing that you're doing wrong, it's just that the system doesn't really have just like this, you know, two thousand dollars and giving to everybody to, to uh, what, at four, uh, twenty-five million dollars, and I'm thinking so if you give everybody that's underwater, or even somebody wants to buy a house, what's two thousand dollars going to do? They may owe more, more than that in taxes, so they're still going to get foreclosed in or church sale. I mean, it's not enough money to really bail anybody out or help anybody sufficiently the cost of homes today um, and materials, even fix them up. So I don't know. I think they're missing the point in, in how to deal with all these vacant homes and helping local governments in dealing with it. And so. I move that we uh, approve the both the adoption of the data stabilization plan. Program number three. Support. Motion by Mr. Frazier, supported by Mr. Steiber. All in favor? Signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion has carried. Thank you, Mr. Stein. Thank you, Mayor President. I would like to thank um, the staff of the Neighborhood Stabilization Program. Program. Erica Williams, Diana Pegler, and Scott Hibowski. The city's finance department does a huge part of that. A lot of effort. The city's legal department. A lot goes into keeping this program while working. I would be remiss not to acknowledge the efforts of those folks. Thank you. Thank you. We have no site plans.
the evening. We've come to the communications portion. And the first uh, person that's requested to speak is Ms. Ella Jo. Section at 
3076694 or the FBI Detroit field office at 313-965-2323. Finally, Denzel is not committed to the federal government, the automobile industry, or the people of Southfield. I'm putting the city on notice not to try to designate anything concerning, concerning Denzel or their property a wetland to force this tax abatement on the people of Southfield. To grant this tax abatement to Denzel is unpatriotic to our government and an insult to our police, firefighters, and taxpayers of this city. Thank you. Said that I did, and I definitely misspoke if I said that. 
I want this all to be on the table. There are other things that I'm going to be bringing forward week to week. The next thing that's coming forward is that allegedly this particular police chief has been having personal services done on our police facilities in authorized only areas. I have the name of the company, I have the project manager, the telephone number, and what I'm going to be asking for are any accounts receivables, any payables that we made to this company on the alleged date that this occurred. If this company doesn't have an invoice that they submitted to us, and these uh, gentlemen or these contractors were there doing personal work for this chief, that has an appearance of gross impropriety. I mean, that peddling influence and some other issues that are so visible now becomes a real issue. But I respect Mr. Charette, and I think that if I was able to speak with him, I think just sharing this point by point, because Ms. Jordan and I met last week, and she was a very skeptical uh, person here, and I believe that meeting for an hour was very beneficial. I didn't even disclose all that I have to present, but I think it's just important because I care about the whole image of this city. I'm just requesting to the chair, as I did at the last meeting, Ms. Seymour, and when you don't look at me and when you don't address me, and it, it seems insulting, but I am asking for that meeting through the chair. For the record, I would like to again state that this timekeeping matter was reviewed in detail by former Chief Dr. Joseph Tom, an internationally recognized expert in police operations, currently on assignment in Iraq under the auspices of the State Department, training Iraqi police recruits. He indicates that this matter has been resolved and any further allegations in this regard are without merit. The next request uh, is from Mr. David Scarborough. Is Mr. Scarborough here? Yes. And uh, you have, I need your name and address for the record, and then you have five minutes from the time that you can. Yes, ma'am. My name is David Scarborough. My address is 20400 Delaware, Redford, Michigan. Um, that's this is the first time ever doing something like this, but it's funny you're talking about the chief that was uh, going to be brought up by me, and I had no no knowledge of him and all this. I just know that I'm here to tell you favors are being done for cops. Um, there's been free toes. Um, speaking of always towing. I'm an ex-employee of always towing almost two years. I did go work for Ross, and uh, I was harassed by the, not only the police department, some, some officers, but by always towing that call. I'm here to just tell you, in regards to that chief, I knew nothing about that. But I was going to bring up, always towing worships the chief's car tows it places. I've towed the car personally for no cost. I, I I mean that was in my little notes to bring that up and I wasn't even going to mention his name but since you said the guy in Iraq, that's the gentleman. Um, I'm very nervous. I was supposed to be here on December 5th. Uh, Mr. Nick Hall made some threats to me if I come in here to this meeting that something going to happen. I know there's been parties with alcohol for the police department. Barbecues, um, free toes, personal toes, personal equipment loaned to some of these named officers, which I don't know if you want me to name the names. I don't know if that's appropriate here or not. No. Yeah, that's that's kind of what I thought. This is not the place to say it. The only name I'm going to mention is Nick Hall and Always Towing. When that, when the contract was being made for the towing 
been threatened with the police pulling me over. I don't even like coming into Southfield because of some of the stuff that goes on in here. Um, there, there is a lot of people know about what's going on. A lot of officers know, and it happens in Lathrop Village as well as Southfield. Lathrop Village is a lot deeper, but your Southfield officers helped Nick Hall get into that contract that he never should have got. I can tell you that people, there were officers that came to the back door and told, excuse me, and told things that were going on with the contract at the time before it made the meeting. He knew a lot of this stuff, so he was able to redo his little uh, saying or thing for the city to get in. He never deserved it. He never should have had it. And uh, there is officers. He does a lot of favors for officers. And a lot of officers call him personally to do a lot of toes that should go to Ross. I mean, that should go to whoever, but um, you know, I come today just to, I was going to bring it to your knowledge because everywhere I've been, I bought it heads and nobody wants to hear. I took it to the state police. The state police, Sergeant Cynthia Feltner, investigated it and her conclusion to me was, and to other people was, Although not ethical, favors for cops is all right. And that's exactly how she worded it to me. I don't believe so. And I don't think the city should put themselves in this kind of position, uh, having one company bring you a bad name, bring you the reputation that you don't need. So. Mr. Governor, your time is just about up. Okay, and with that, I just thank you for the few moments, and I probably didn't say it like I wanted to, but I just thank you wanted to make it aware. Thank you. And, Chair, uh, yeah, the allegations you, you make are very uh, uh, important that uh, if they are accurate, you clean up whatever is out there. And my suggestion would be to put that all in writing and submit it to the city administrator.
brother man. Yes. And what happens, of course, we don't know everything. I don't know everything that's happening. Yes. I don't know the where's and the, about the towing. I know a little bit. You mentioned the chief. Yes. But the chief was on the other side. He wanted the other company at the time. Not Ross. Okay. And you mentioned that he was he was helping Ross. No, always towing. Or he was helping always towing. He was helping always towing. His car was being stored always towing. Right. We pull it out and wash it and tow places for him. Right. Then. So I can give you some answers there. Okay. And it wasn't us. It wasn't the council at all. No, I'm not saying it was you. I'm just trying to bring it the awareness to the city so you know what's some of the stuff that's going on. Well, why don't you go up our heads? We're, we're the local. We don't know about it. I'm new to this, so yes. I guess that's what I have to do. That's right. And maybe you'll find out the truth. Because mm -hmm. after what you said is not true that I know about. And I got into that fight. I got into it. I think you were there too. You know, you weren't at any of those meetings with Always and Ross? Okay. Now I'll tell you that something you don't know. The bidding process was violated. I know that. And not by us. Oh, I, I'm not saying it was done by you. It was, I know who And I questioned it. I questioned it just like you. I was there always. I was working there. I know who did. I mean, I saw myself. And it I was, was, the bidding process was violated for your benefit. It didn't work. Yeah. I agree. Okay, so go ahead and get the guy. Go ahead and Following okay. task for a criminal ta task. All I was doing was making it aware. See what happens. Okay. Then maybe you'll find out the truth. Or maybe you won't. Then yeah, maybe you won't, because I know the truth I was there. Because I'm tired of all the allegations people are making, and they don't know what they're talking about. Sir, I, 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 mean, I didn't say you didn't know what you're talking about. I was there, so I'm not saying allegation. I'm saying what I saw, what I personally went then. <clears throat> then we're not the ones you go to. Okay, well. I thought you went to chain of command and up the step and let y'all know, but I will give it to this young man and let him know. For my part, you can find the culprits. Okay. I don't care. If they've done something wrong, get them. Uh, I've been saying that for 30 years. Okay. Through the chair, Mr. Lance is accurate in that I've never heard of any of this. I know. I've made a list of everything you said, and I'm unaware of any of it. So I'd like to know more about it, please. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Chair, I just I just want to emphasize um, we went through a long and um, and a very detailed process in the whole contract for the city. The gentleman did drop off information to my office related. To that contract. Um, during that period, I did offer and share any information that I received with the appropriate people at that time, that would have been the city administrator and others. I'm not aware of any tolls being made, uh, washing of cars or service. I've never heard that. <coughs> I heard we were given information related to the contract. So, is this I agree if the gentleman has this information, he should move forward with it. As you all know, um, there was a a background check. The things that brought them to my attention were the licensing of the people who were driving the types of vehicle, and we discussed that at length during the awarding of the contract. The type of vehicle um, who actually ran what parts of company and those issues that I was made aware of were actively discussed. Now these issues of washing cars and towing cars and, and providing services, um, I, I strongly believe we need to look into that because that's not the expectation of, of any of our um, employees. I'm not aware of our police being involved in anything that is not of um, requirement of their job. Um, I think they get discount on coffee and donuts at different restaurants. I'm very much aware of that. The company has done that. I'm not aware of this. Uh, but any any resident that feels that we as a city or us as employees are not upholding our part of our obligation of doing 
request for recognition is from Mr. Gerald Long. Mr. President, my name is Gerard Long. Since 1968, I've lived at 1788 Louis Street. I'm here tonight to talk about one of Council's favorite corporate friends, Benso. Those nice folks that live up the road a quarter mile north of Telex Mall. I don't know if you folks have read the January 31st front page story in the Detroit Free Press about Benso or not. If not, check it out at the library or simply Google Benso, D-E-N-S-O. And you'll be surprised to learn that we have a world-class fellow living right here in our own neighborhood. Benso is no Mr. Rogers, that's for sure. Benso, along with their business partners, scammed the auto industry and the auto industry's customers, that's you folks, out of untold billions of dollars via price fixing. So far, Benso, along with their fellow business partners, that is, fellow felons, have agreed to pay $548 million in fines to Uncle Sam. This is the second largest fine of this type in history. Plus, four executives are going to jail. I would like to urge anyone within the sound of my voice who has the additional who has additional information regarding Denzel's criminal conduct to call the Antitrust Division National Criminal Division section at 202-307-6694. That is 202-307-6694 or the FBI's Detroit Field Office at 313-965-2323. That is 313-95. Council being a good friend of Denzel is going to ask you folks to help pay for Denzel's fine at the upcoming March 19 City Council meeting. How Council has a clever scheme called tax abatement. Now Denzel already has a tax abatement, but this is a real emergency, so now Council wants to give Denzel an additional tax abatement piggybacked on their already existing tax abatement to help Denzel pay the fine. This emergency is just like the emergency like last March of 3rd when we voted to retain the police. In this case, the upcoming March 19th vote is to retain the criminals, the felons, that Denzel. Now after we've helped pay for Denzel's fine, where are we going to get the money to make up the difference? Good question. Well, we can squeeze some of the money from the May 3rd village and maybe squeeze some more money out of the police and firemen's health fund care, health fund fund. Everyone has to chip in to help Denzel. This is called shared sacrifice. Now I'd like to point out that this is not a one-day news story. There are several ongoing nationwide or worldwide investigations into Denzel's criminal conduct as I speak. Let me repeat that, folks. There are several ongoing worldwide investigations into Denzel's criminal conduct as I speak. There may be more Denzel fines down the road. That means maybe another emergency millage for Southfield. What does, Southfield. what does the Southfield Council get out of this tax abatement, you might ask? The answer, covered away. That is a $150,000 corporate gift from Denso for Council's favorite project, Carbon away. This is a case of one hand washing the other. Sad to say, one of the hands belongs to a felon. Does the city of Southfield want to partner with a worldwide organized crime syndicate? We're talking about habitual criminals here with at least a 10-year track record or more. Now, if you folks believe in rewarding criminal behavior with your tax dollars, I suggest you stay at home on March 19th. Not me. I will be here with bells on. I'll be telling counsel to take a page out of Nancy Reagan's book and just say, no to Denso. No to Denso. Again, I would like to urge anyone within the sound of my voice who has additional information regarding Denso's criminal conduct to call the Antitrust Division National Criminal Enforcement Section at 202-307-6694. That is 202-307-6694 or the FBI's Detroit Field Office at 313-965-2323. That is 313-965-2323. Thank you, Madam President. Thank you. Can I just respond to Mr. Mullen? Um, please don't.
don't presume that um, we haven't even been presented with something. So please don't presume that uh, this is a done deal. Um, and I said, please do not presume that a request from Danzo for a tax abatement is a done deal. Or that people sitting up here are in favor of it. And that, that's pretty much what your, uh, that's what your message sounds to me. That's all. Thank you, Mr. Judge Tyron. Uh, council, next we have uh, a bunch report. Any council questions? Uh, Madam Chair. I would like to uh, move all three of these at the same time. And these are expense reports for Mr. Percassi, the Detroit Economic Club uh, on January the 11th, January the 17th, and January the 30th, 2012. Support. I have a motion by Mr. Frazier, supported by Mr. Jamar. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Motion is carried. Mr. Records indicate that I abstain. Thank you, Mr. Percassi.
one of the focuses. It was on how cities can increase the literacy and the performance of our children. And although we're not the educators, we're not the classroom, we can create an environment in our community that says the children in our community, again, I'm going to use that standard, that they do read and they do perform and they do excel in education. Um, I'm, the, the mayor of Bloomberg is one who is really being a leader when it comes to, and the mayor of Los Angeles, these major cities who are saying that if we really want a, a strong city, then we have to have children who are achieving and making, um, meeting those marks of achievement in their city. And we can't sit with our head in the sand and say it's not our responsibility. Because every time there's something bad said about our schools or our children, it's a black mark on our whole city. So I think um, it's a wonderful opportunity and I, I would um, welcome the opportunity to talk to the city about it. But that was just a compelling my eight books from cover to cover, great specific, could actually be equivalent to a child going to summer school. And what, what it does is that every year it's our children, I don't know why we in America, will not understand that, that summer school break is not a necessity anymore, especially when we are in world competition um, in other countries that are competing with us, their children do not have a whole summer off. Our children are actually losing at least 30 days of school that's being brought back up to where they were when they left. It's wasted time when it comes to our educational process. So I'm probably